Last time we explored verses um, 1 through 11 and discovered basically two things. First, when we acknowledge Christ as, as our Savior and surrender our lives to His Lordship and are baptized, then we can live a resurrected life as we seek the things above, thing, things in heaven. The second thing we learned uh, was that we have been resurrected with Christ when, um, and, and as we are resurrected, then we die daily to the things of the earth. So living for Christ requires both dying daily to the old life, but also living or being resurrected daily for the new life. In verse, 11, uh, verse 9, Paul talks about putting off the old man. To put off means to remove uh, the old self with urgency, but also with intentionality and purpose. So it means to remove it, not simply to remove it, but to remove it for a purpose. When a mechanic uh, comes home, he usually takes off his dirty, greasy, and heavy clothes. Housekeepers, plumbers, builders, electricians, and all manual laborers change their clothes as soon as they get home. And I'm pretty sure that mom usually makes sure that, um, that the hubby uh, changes his clothes before getting his dirty hands on the plates, right? And to some degree, that's the picture that Paul is using. In fact, in verse 11, Paul uses the metaphor of putting on. So verses 1 through 11 talks about putting off. Now we're going to read 12 through 17, and we're going to do the opposite. We put off earlier, now we're going to put on as we read these verses. The metaphor of putting off refers to doing away with fornication, mental impurity, carnal passions, evil desires, covetousness, idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, slander, blasphemy, obscene language, and lying. Putting off means stripping down, but no one would take off their filthy clothes and go around naked unless you're home alone and no one can see you, but even that feels a little uncomfortable. So we put on clothes. After a good shower and before dinner, it makes sense to put on new clothes or clean clothes. We don't go back and put the other clothes, the old clothes, the dirty clothes. So being aware that, that, that it is not enough to put off the old man. It's not enough. It's not enough to re remove all the sinful desires. It's not enough. Paul here then introduces the idea of new clothes for the new you. And he's not just talking about clean clothes. He's, he thinks he's going all the way. You know, let's get you, a, you know, brand new garment, not just clean clothes. See? And so he introduces us to the new clothes for the new you. And this new garment is, is needed for the new you because it is the only way to mature in Christ. If you want to grow, you need the new you, the new garments. Verses 10 to 11, as we read uh, uh, last time, introduces introduce us to the new you and the new clothes. Verses uh, 10 and 11 um, um, say, and, 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 and have put on the new clothes Self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is in all and in all. Paul was trying to convey the, the idea that wherever he went, he found the same, the people everywhere clothed the same way. He expected everyone, everywhere he went, he expected every member of the church to wear the same garment. Yes, the new garment for the new them. 
Most of the, of our, you know, of, 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 of our time, uh, you know, that we're going to spend, we're going to spend it in, you know, verses um, 12 through 15, but we're going to look all the way to verse 17, so hopefully that serves as a bridge for the next time we get together. So let's, uh, let's uh, read the rest of the passage. Let's look at um, verses 12 through 14. And what I see there, uh, the, the first point I see there is that there, the, the new clothes is, um, is equal to uh, the character of Christ. Verse 12 says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiving, forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Paul describes this new garment in eight virtues, in eight pieces. So this is a brand new, beautiful garment that comes with all the accessories. The first, uh, you know, the first two uh, virtues have to do with how we relate to other people. In other words, social uh, virtues, what I call. So the first social virtue is having compassionate hearts. Paul tells us that compassion must come from the heart. The heart. Now, listen here. To, to the Hebrew mind, uh, healthy affections were found, listen, were found somewhere in the kidneys or the liver. So when they said, I love you with all my heart, they, they said, they meant, I love you with all my kidneys. I love you with all my liver. Because it, it's sort of in the center, right? And so they assumed that the, the deepest affections came from, from the God. I mean, literally. In fact, that's what the, the word in the Greek means. Amor entrañable, right? Uh, from, from the bowels, from deep within. That's how, compassionate, you know, that's how compassionate we must be. Not just approach someone with a sandwich or, yeah, let me buy you lunch, but rather to be moved with compassion towards that person. There's a difference when we are just doing, you know, going through the motions. Oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I need to feed this person. There's, there's a difference between that and, man, I feel for this man. I feel for this woman. I'm going to buy some food because I feel for her or for him. And for that reason, Paul stresses the importance of compassion coming from inside, a compassion that springs from the gut, from within, deep within. The, the, you know, compassion doesn't come from the mind. It doesn't come from making sense. Compassion doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that God, being us enemies of God, He went out to find us. We were His enemies, and yet He rescued us, still being His enemies. He had compassion on us, which means that it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that God reached out to us, that He loved us when we were all, were all dirty and, you know, and, and, and rejected, and yet He did. That's true compassion. If God has God's will, He loved us from His entrails, deep within. And we also must show compassion. And that's, you know, that's the first uh, sort of... Uh, it's interesting that Paul points that as the first piece of this garment, right? The second social uh, virtue is kindness. In, in Paul's times, uh, kindness or, or gentleness was also used to describe, listen, wine that aged and lost, lost its bitterness. Now, I, I you know, I, I don't... I've never had issues with alcohol, so I don't know what it means, right? Uh, you know, this is foreign to me, but, but, but I can tell you that people who are experts at this know that there are some wines that are, you know, the wines that have aged 
are good. They're, they're good wine. They don't taste like alcohol, but they taste delicious. That's what they say. You know, there are wines that cost $10,000, $20,000, $100,000. Uh, I wouldn't spend a dime on, on you know, <laughs> on, on, uh, you know I, I, no, I won't, right? I'll wait, I will, I'll wait until I get to heaven to taste that one. But, but notice, please, that kindness is like good wine. It's like good, you know, wine that, that just tastes good. And it makes you happy as well because that's what wine is about. It's not just simply about drinking. It is about, what? Bringing down your inhibitions and you showing your emotions. That's what alcohol does. Um, right? And so Paul is saying that kindness is like that. It, it, brings, it brings down our barriers and it shows what we are or what God has made us to be. In fact, Jesus in Matthew eleven thirty two 32 uses the same word. To describe his yoke, yes, his yoke, his burden, as being easy. That's the same word. He says that his, his yoke is kind. It's easy. In other words, his yoke on the neck, right, does not hurt or injure. We could say that this yoke is light, gentle, and easy to carry. That's what Jesus invites us. He says, you know what? My yoke, compared to the one that the world puts on you, man, my yoke is easy. That's what he says. My yoke adorns you. It makes you look good. Right? Even though it's a yoke. Yes, a yoke because we are yoked with Jesus as our Lord. But, but it still makes us look good. And not only that, but it's easy to carry. It's the same word. So Jesus is saying that his yoke is kind. See? In the first translations of the Bible, kindness was also translated as benignity. Yeah, the very old versions which even today is used in, in, in medicine. Well, in Spanish, it's, it, it's used too. But, but in medicine, it's, it's used to describe benign sickness or, you know, as opposed to malignant cancers, right? So one of your garments, you know, garment pieces is kindness. So we ought not, we ought not to be malignant cancers. We should not be cancerous. Because bitterness and anger spreads quickly. Sometimes much faster than kindness. And anger and bitterness likes company. They both like company. The next two virtues describe the state of mind that, that we, should, um, we should wear. The first of... of, of, of of this category of state of mind is humility. Say with me, humility. humility. Yes. To be humble is to have a quiet, sober, and temperate opinion of oneself. We should not be too quickly to communicate who we are. We should really think about it every time we are asked who we are. We're not, of course, used to Asking that, not in our society, but, but oftentimes when we talk, we're quickly, we're ready to describe who we are. This is what I think, that's part of who we are. Oh, that's my opinion is this, even if we don't say my opinion is this, but if you give your opinion, that's, that's showing who you are, see? And so, to be humble is to be quiet, sober, and, and temperate. It is a quality of our inner being, but it is, all, it is also a quality of our outer, outer person. It's how we relate to other people. It's not just how we feel about us, but how we feel about others. In fact, the, the Greeks ridiculed humility because they believed it was only for those who were trembled on by society. And sometimes I suspect that some of us think the same about humility. They were like the Greeks. We don't like to be seen as weak, as small, as tiny. 
The society says, believe in yourself. Every, 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 every pep talk that I hear, there's always this current, right? Believe in yourself. It's about the self. It's, it's not about who gives you identity. It's about who you are by yourself. You, yourself, and you. Humility, however, embraces our smallness in comparison to God. We're tiny. We're not meaningless, but we're tiny. We're small when we think of God. That is why when we come to God, we lift our hands in dependency. We kneel in surrender. We open our voices to proclaim that he is our Lord, his Lord over us, that we're small compared to him, that we come to his majesty, we worship him in all his splendor, his majesty, he's bigger than we can think of, that he's greater and mighty, powerful beyond comprehension. But humility also fosters modesty and simplicity in who we are in relationship to others. Life is happier when you're modest and live a simple life. It is better. It is better not to have so many things in life that confuse our priorities and rob us of the time that we should dedicate to the Lord. Too many things at once, competing for our attention. And that is, in some ways, uh, you know, a symptom that we have a complicated life, that we've complicated our lives ourselves. People in debt cannot even give an offering because they just haven't, they don't have their priorities in order. People in broken relationships who don't know how to behave or how to respond. And the Lord says, we need to be humble, modest, simple. Simple in the middle of this very complex society in which we live. In fact, complex world for that matter. The second virtue that we should wear in the category uh, of the state of mind is meekness. Can you say with me, meekness? Now, they, they are related, but they're not the same. Meekness was used to describe how horses allowed themselves to be guided by the rider. Listen, a horse can kill its rider, but doesn't because it is meek. See? A horse has more, more, much more power than the, the, the strongest human being there, there can be. And yet they are... Docile, docile, right? Docile. Meekness is power under control, like, like the policeman who, who has an, an enormous power and is gone, but chooses to submit the police protocol to de-escalate the situation. A policeman that talks instead of shooting, that is meekness. It is power under control. See? And so we are indeed, yes, weak compared to God. But when we come to God, we become powerful in Christ and through Christ. Without him, we're nothing. But his power in us and through us requires meekness. Because even our authority in Christ could be taken in the wrong direction. So, and you know, that, that's what meekness is. Jesus tells us to imitate him. He is meek and humble. His attitude of humility, of meekness, he, the, the, more, the most powerful human being on earth was in Christ. And yet we don't see him calling bolts of fire to burn the people that rejected him. Meekness. The next three virtues uh, deal with how we should act. Listen, when we get hurt, 
The first of these three is patience. Say patience, please. Patience. It's made up of two Greek words. The first one is macro, which, which, you know, which, uh, where we get the word macro, uh, obviously. Macro, big, large, right? And then the second word is thumia. Thumia. From, from which we get the word time. Thumia. Time. Sounds familiar, right? Thumia. It's time. It is also translated as courage because it, it Thumia also, not, not only is it translated as time, but it is also translated as, as, the, as the emotion that we feel as we in, in responding to someone. So that's why sometimes it is translated, the, you know, the Thumia is translated as courage or stamina. See? Thumia, stamina. Or guess, guess, guess what? Anime. Anyone familiar with that word? Anime comes from the word tumia. See? Sounds familiar, right? Anime. It's the, it's the ability to feel something, right? It's the ability to feel something, listen, something that can be used, um, you know, um, uh, productively. So patience is, is feeling, feeling something and yet also leading those emotions in the right direction. By waiting, see, being patient is, you know, or, or long suffering. Some other versions translate it as long suffering, which means to endure for a long time the desire to seek revenge for the wrongs done to us. That's patience. If you have gotten hurt, and if you are patient. Patient with yourselves, not so much with God. God knows when, when he can execute justice. He knows when. And I remind you, it's not your calendar and not on your time. But God, 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 God will bring justice. What is left for us is to endure for a long time the desire to seek revenge. And let God do the rest but, but sometimes asking God for justice is, is nothing more than, than asking Him to take revenge for what we have suffered. But we, we do not have to ask God to, to avenge the damage that we have suffered because the Lord has already promised that He will do it. He will do it, yes. What should we do instead? We need to wait. We need to be patient. See? What is under our volition is to be patient with everyone at all times. The good people and the bad people. The people that we love and the people that we don't quite love. I don't want to say hate, but we must be patient with everyone. Because I, I am patient. I'm patient when I'm the first in line. And I'm always patient like that. I'm patient when I'm, I'm driving and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ahead of everyone. I'm very patient. I mean, yeah. I am, I am an, an exemplary Christian when I am driving by myself. Believe me. Mm, the problem is when I have to be second, third, and, and in the... And it takes time. Right? Hmm. The second virtue of how we should act when we are hurt is bearing with one another. That's a lot harder than being patient. Because being patient means you wait, just wait. But bearing with one another is being proactive towards the person that is hard to get along with. It says one another. In the old English, it meant want one and other. That's what it meant. One and other, which became event eventually became one another. Another, right? We are all imperfect, which means that at some point, we all can become unbearable. Hello. Yes. It's not just for the bad people, folk. 
It's not just for the people that we have on our blacklist, if you will. It's also for us. Sometimes we are unbearable. Yes, we get difficult sometimes. Sometimes we get difficult to get along and people, people you know, the, the, the smart people just leave space between us and them so we don't lash out, right? But we can all be unbearable at some point. Sometimes my wife tells the kids, uh, well, not so kids, but you know, you know what I'm saying. He, she tells them, hey, you know, just you know, stay away. Because I hear the whisper, stay away, stay. right? And I'm like, I'm like, or oh, you're gonna get burned, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and, and the treatment is reciprocal as well, right? Yes. This is why Paul starts this chapter by saying, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where, where Christ is. In verse 3, he reminds us, for you have died. In other words, we have to remember that we have to continue to die or we will become unbearable as well. We are resurrected to live a new life, but we must die to the old life every single day. The old self is intolerable, but the new self is easygoing, pleasant, and fun. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when you are in love with Christ and, and, and you know, you just feel like you're, you're, you know, you're jumping over clouds and your relationship with God is so good. You, you, ah, how beautiful. I love this Christian life, man. It's like surfing. Man, it feels good, easy, right? But then something comes your way and everything turns the opposite and you become mad and intolerable. Yeah. Every time you see an unbearable person and choose to bear with them, you should be reminded that you were once like that. And then now you are a new you. Thank God for that. You are a new you, a new, a better you, a, a better version of you, if you will, in Christ. The third virtue of how we should, we, we should act when we get hurt is forgiving each other. It means doing something for someone else that is pleasing, agreeable, fav favorable, and gratifying. Yes. So forgive, you know, forgiveness is not, just, it's not just words. I forgive you. I mean, I told you I forgive you. Right? How many times do I have to say it? I forgive you already. Shut up. I mean, we're not, we don't say that, but I think that was what we're feeling inside, right? Why are you bringing up the same issue again? Woman, did you forgive me that time or, or what? I mean, because you, you're bringing it up again, and, and then the fight goes on, right? Man, and, you know, jabbing each other, right? If I'm reading your, your mail, it's because it's the spirit that is speaking to you. I hope that you get the point, right? And the Holy Spirit, knowing that we tend to, we tend, um, you know, to, to um, we, we, we tend to, you know, bring up the issue again and again. Tells us in, in verse 13, if, if one has a complaint against each other, if you are repeating the same complaint again and again, especially, listen, especially with couples, that conversation you had five years ago and still you're having, you cannot get over that one? Well, that complaint, Paul addresses it very clearly. He says, he says, if one has complained against one another as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. That's, that's, that's how you're going to fix your, your issue of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. You must remember that you've been forgiven. And, and you think that you're, you know, the other person's 
errors are greater than yours, right? But at least, and, and yet when you think about it, really, I mean, your sins were so grotesque and so, so big and so large and so hopeless that Christ had to come to die for you. Man, that should tell you something, right? You were not very handsome or very beautiful before. Come on. You didn't smell good before, spiritually speaking. Right? Until Christ came. He came and washed you, cleansed you, put in brand new clothes, right? And now you need to behave like a new you by forgiving whoever has hurt you. Now I realize that forgiveness is, is, is a, it's a, it's a hard work. I wish it were like, you know, snapping a finger. I mean, I forgive you, right? And I will never remember that. Only God can do that. We, it's hard for us. That's an impossibility. I get hurt. It's very likely that the rest of my life, I'm going to remember the hurt. But the point is not to forget. The point is to be able to forgive to the extent that that hurt doesn't impact me anymore. That's the, that's the goal. There's a book called Forgive and Forget. It's great. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I wish I, I, I could forget. I, I, I really, I've, I've asked God, please, Lord, help me. I don't want to remember this, but then it just comes back. It curls back into my mind. And Paul says, Hey, listen, if you have a complaint, if this complaint is reoccurring, if you're bringing it up again and again, right? Whether it is in your mind or in your relationship, then you have to remember that God forgave you. And on, on that virtue, on that fact, you need to forget the other person because God they, they did a greater job for you by forgiving you than the errors that you're trying to forgive in the other person's life. Forgiveness takes, takes work, and, and, and it's not just one thing. Forgiveness could be intellectual. Yeah, I, I know what the word says, and I'm gonna, I, I choose to forgive you. That's intellectual exercise. Not good. I forgive you. You have to say the words. But you know, sometimes you don't feel it. Hello? Right? So forgiveness is not just intellectual. Forgive, forgiveness is also emotional. Saying I forgive you is one thing. Not feeling anger against you is another. And that takes, pro that takes time. It takes time. And that's just, it's not just women. It's men too. We, we have a hard time with forgiving as well. It's just that women are a little more. Not emotional. Perhaps more readily to say it. Right? Men don't easily say it. We, we show it in other ways, right? In attitudes, perhaps. Hmm. Like, I'm not going to get close to you, man. I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to address you. I'm not going to speak to you because I'm still angry at you. I'm not going to say to you, but that's what, what I'm saying because I am keeping my distance from you. That's how men normally deal with, with that. Women get, get in your face, especially if you're married. Right? Yep. Just like that. It's like my core is touching my nose. Right? It's like, come on, woman! Stay away! It feels so intense, right? But, but, but so Paul says, no, listen, listen. Go back again to the cross. Remember what Christ has done for you or you're not going to be able to forgive. Because it's not intellectual, choosing to, but it's also emotional, doing away with those bad feelings. So it's not just intellectual, it's not just emotional, it's also spiritual. And spiritual forgiveness is when, when you come together, when there is so much forgiveness, then you come together and you become one. You, one with your parents who maybe hurt you, or, you or, or you with your children who hurt you, or you with your spouse if you got hurt, or you with a brother or sister if they hurt you. 
in the spirit. You unite it again. That's true forgiveness, see? But it starts with intellectual. Choosing to forgive is one thing. Another is feeling. The forgiveness is another stage. But the last one, the spiritual one, to come together in Christ, that's, it, to some degree, it should be the easiest one. But listen, God will not allow us to be united unless we have forgiveness and we have done our part by remembering that Christ paid for our sins and on, on that account then we remember to forgive others. Forgiveness or forgiving others is a command because Christ has forgiven us. It's not a choice. It's not that you leave here and you say, well, I'm, you know, I'll think about it. And that was a good sermon, Pastor. Preacher, I'll give you a 10. I'll, I'll think about it. Well, keep thinking about it. You're going to get more bitter the more you think about it. Because you're not going to shake it off. You're not going to overcome it unless you come to Christ and you come to terms that he has forgiven you. And then on that fact, you also forgive. And the last virtue is love. Agape. Sometimes translated as goodwill or charity in, in the oldest versions. Agape is also translated as benevolence, right? Benevolence. It is good volition. Bene is good and volens volition. It's, it's goodwill. It's acting kind towards someone. It's, it's a beneficial action. See, love, 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 you know, can be a feeling, yes, we can feel love. But mind you, it is a deep feeling. It's not just like, oh, I feel love. You know, I feel love for you. Like, oh yeah, like puppy love. That's not love, that's feeling. Love comes from deep within, right? Yeah, it can be a, a, a feeling, a deep feeling that is, However, it, can, it is also an action. So love is not just something I feel, but it's something that I feel so much that it makes me move in the right direction. That's what this kind of love is. Love is described in, four, in, chapter, in verse 14 as that which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Ah, it binds everything together in perfect harmony. In other words, when you have love in, you know, all over you, you look good. And there's harmony. All the garment pieces fit together. That's why women, right? They put this, this blouse and this skirt and whoosh, they switch another and then another. And then, you know, the whoo man. That's a, that's a lot of work. I don't know. It gets intense, right? <laughs> Not for a woman. Well... For a man, it is, it could be torturous. But love is that which binds everything together. In other words, in other words, you don't necessarily have to combine all the pieces. As long as you have them on, if you have love, then there is perfect harmony. Now listen, there's perfect harmony. In other words, all the pieces fit together, but you also fit well within a group when you have love. You're liked and you're loved and you're welcome. And I'm not talking about clicks, okay? Oh, I like that person. No, I like this person, right? No, I'm not talking about that. Love permeates every, everything and everyone, see? It, it is a perfect bond that unites all virtues. We, we must have, the, you know, the, the God kind of love. That, this is the God kind of love if we want to be compassionate, kind, humble, meek, patient, bearable, and, and, and forgiving. Without love, I mean, you can do all those things. You can pretend. You can pretend to be compassionate or kind or humble or meek, patient, and bearable. You can, you can pretend for a day. But if there is no love, and all those pieces will fall, you're going to end up naked. The picture is, is of a Roman soldier, his entire garment held together by the belt. That's what it is. It's a belt, right? I mean, I don't need this, this belt. I put it on just for looks, to be honest. And I don't need
need it. It's just so I can look good here. Right? I mean, I don't I rarely look at my watch. I, I just wear it because I like it. I like to look nice. And so do you. Right? But back then, the soldiers depended on that, on that belt. It, it held everything together. The same should be with love. We should love one another. And, and when we love, all the other garment pieces fit together. We can, we can be kind. We can be loving. We can be bearable. See? We can, we can be patient if we love. Love is the thread of the necklace of the virtues. If you, if you cut the, the, you know, if you cut the thread, what happens if you cut the thread? Of a, of a necklace. It falls apart, right? All the pieces, you know. Right? These eight virtues are the new clothes for the new you. That's, that's all you need. And all you need is just one garment. You don't, you don't need, you know, you don't, you don't need to wait for fall to change garments. It's one is enough. It makes you look good every time, every season, young and old, same garment. It makes you look good. These are virtues are, and again, the, the new clothes for the new you that the displays Christ's char character. When we wear these, we show Christ to the world and to one another. another. Yes. Yes. You know, I have never known a clean person who falls in love with a dirty, smelly person. I've never met one. Maybe you've met one. I don't know. I've never met one. Uh-uh. Right? This, this wardrobe adorns us so Jesus will look handsome, majestic, beautiful. It's not about you anyway. I want to remind you. It's about Christ showing up to this world through you. See, that's what it is about. The old clothes are, you know, are, are for the old man, but the new clothes, Christ himself, is for the new child, the new young lady, the new, the new youth, the new woman, and the new, the new man. Christ will look attractive and majestic and people who, who, do, who do not know him yet will fall in love with him. When they see him in you, when they see these virtues, some of them will even ask you, even if you don't have the guts to tell them, they'll ask you, what, what is it with you? you? You look so peaceful. You look tranquil, right? I mean, just, man, I mean, it looks like everything is going good for you. I'm all messed up. Look at my, you know, look at my marriage. Look at my... You know, my, my finance, look at, you know. And then that's when you start. Then you come in and you say, well, you know what? It's, it's, it's what, I, what I'm wearing. And your friend might say, oh, oh, you, tell me about it, right? And then you can start telling, well, it's about being loving, kind, bearable. It's about loving Christ. That's what... That's why, that's why my, my life is different, right? What would happen if all of us um, who have been resurrected put on these virtues? What would happen? What would happen if we all wore this, 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 this garment? What would happen? I think the church would be, would be, would be, we would have fewer dis disputes and, and, and churches would, would not be divided and churches would be filled with people. They, this place would be packed if we all had those virtues on us. Whole families, cities, and countries would come to Christ if we had these virtues on us. So let's look at the, my, my second point here. And it's in verses 5 through uh, 15 through um, 14, which is God's peace and thankfulness. Paul was very intentional in putting this segment here because talking about the vir these virtues is hard work. And then he brings in something that is very romantic. Look at this idea. It's just beautiful. 
Look at verse 15. It says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be, what? Thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with what? Thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. What? Giving thanks to God the Father through him. Look at the emphasis. Do you see the emphasis? Paul mentioned thanksgiving three times. Mm -hmm. When we put on Christ, imitating his, his virtues, we experience, listen, we experience the, the peace of God. I don't know about you, but as I, as I, develop, you know, as I develop my relationship with Christ, and I go deeper, and, and I grow more and more in Him, I feel more His peace. I feel happier. Yes, I feel happier. I feel lighter. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little more giddy. When, when I'm, you know, when, 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 when I am putting on these, these garments, I feel God's peace. And that, and that shows in my thankfulness. See, thanksgiving comes out of a heart that is surrendered to Christ, that it shows Christ through behavior, words, things, and my thoughts, and, 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 you know, and attitudes, and words. When our character is being transform, transformed by Christ, our peace will increase. It's sort of an inevitable byproduct of walking with Christ, of wearing Him, of having His virtues on us. See? That is why Paul tells us in, in, you know, in, 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 in verse 15, and be thankful. Right? And in verse 16, singing with thank thankfulness, he says. Singing with thankfulness. Not just be thankful, meaning not only having an attitude of thanksgiving, but also singing with thankfulness. And then in verse 17, he repeats, giving thanks to God. See, thanks, thanks, thanks. When we wear, the, when we wear this garment, we're going to be thankful. We're going to be thankful for the musicians to be up here and playing their songs instead of coming mad, you know, ah, man, you know, ah, man, man, man. And the singers can sing their heart out to God. And they can, they, you know, the, the responsibility is not to take us to God's throne. The responsibility is to worship God and we joining them. That's what, that's what it is about. The worship leader is not responsible to lead us to the throne of God. He's just responsible to lead us in song. We, however, must join the worship leader. And if worship leader is not in the presence of God, then we can go to him too. Separate, if that is the case. But again, everything that we do, we must do it with thanksgiving. And it is here where Paul gives us two practical applications. First, in verse 16, he tells us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's a practical application. In other words, read the word of God. Whenever you come together, read the word of God. Whenever there's a problem, go back to the word and quote the, the scripture. Don't let others make you think that you're a fanatic. No, quote the scripture. Get the word out. The word says this and that. The, with, with not only encouragement, but the authority. Our wisdom has just great limitations, but the word of God is perfect. Right? So he says, let the word of God rich, uh, dwell in you richly. Dwell, live in you. I think it talks about memorization, reading, comprehension of Scripture. This refers to the words of Christ being in our mind and in our hearts, in our minds memorized, in our hearts moving us from within. Have you noticed that Jews combine moving and singing to memorize the Scriptures? Have you noticed that? When they go to the, you know, the, 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 the wall of laments, have you, have you seen them? What, what are they doing? What? Right? They're singing and moving. 
They move and sing. They, they've known for centuries that, that song and move make us uh, uh, memorize scripture more, more easily. Right? I remember, uh, you know, memorizing the, the tablet, you know, the, the math, math, uh, math tablets. You just memorize them singing them, right? Rap or whatever. My, you know, children learned that they rapped, you know, uh, you know their, their, their math. To, to learn it. Well, that's because song and move helps. See? If you want the peace of Christ, let the scripture abound in your hearts. To make my, my you know, what I do when I read the scripture, some, you know, sometimes, sometimes I, I just don't feel like reading. I have to I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I feel tired. I'm tired. Or, or maybe, maybe my heart is, is a little bit of anguish about some situation that I'm aware of. And so I have to force myself to read. And, and, and it's hard just to read the scripture. So here's what I do. I take the word, the scripture, and I sing it. I sing it. So I'm going to do this in prompt, so forgive me for my bad pitch. But so, so, so what I do is I, I you know, go to the scripture and I say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside his waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they come from me. You prepare me a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will tell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what I do. That's what I do. And you know what happens? I get in a good mood. And I feel happier. And, and then I start feeling God so close to me as I do those things. It's very simple now, complicated at all. Singing the scripture, and that's what Paul says, is saying. Sing the scripture. And, and not, only, not only is he saying sing the scripture, sing it to one another. Now some will, you know, some will say, you know, Pastor, I can't sing. But that's precisely why Paul says singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You can sing in your heart. If all you can do is hum it, well, hum it. If all you can do is imagine that you are singing it, but sing it. Sing it in your heart. You do not have to be a professional singer or, or even on pitch for that matter. You just have to sing from your heart. And, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the miracle is. You know, if, if, if we, you know, if someone has a bad pitch, I don't know if the miracle is in, in how God hears you, maybe. Maybe the miracle is in God's ear, God ears, or or maybe the miracle is when you open your mouth, He makes everything sort of, you know, pitch perfect. I don't know, but God loves it. God loves to hear you sing. He loves it. It's one of His favorite things. How do I know? Because in heaven, there's always song. God loves singing. In fact, the scripture says that he sings and whistles over us. He sings over us like a, like a mom and a dad sings a lullaby over their child. Standing in God's presence, you, know, you don't have to worry about it. Here you might be self-conscious, right? Some of you don't lift your voices because you think, oh, I'm you know, I don't sing too well. You know, 
Well, they're, they're going to mock me if I sing, so I'm just going to sing. I'm just going to whisper it. That's fine if that's what you want to do. But standing in God's presence, you don't have to worry about it. You don't sing for the next person. You don't sing for the person next to you. You sing for the one who gave you life, the one who resurrected you from the dead. When your heart sings the word, you do not, have, you do, you do not even have to open your mouth. This way you can sing at work, on the bus, while you drive at night, daylight, or in the shower. Just lift your voice and sing the scripture to you and to God. Let me conclude with, you know, by repeating a simple question. What, what would happen if, if we all put on these virtues? I think the church would be would have less strife. We would be, we would not be divided in our opinions. In fact, they would become secondary. And we would see the whole, you know, whole families uh, come to Christ. Our friends would come to Christ. Our city would be much better if all who profess Christ put on these virtues. We would be a force to reckon with if we did this, instead of, instead of getting angry at politics, for or against, or instead of you, every time you get some bad news or something about your politician, you, you just get, especially at this junction, right? Instead of that, sing to God. So once, once last time, well, what would happen if our city, in, in our city, if all of us wore these garments? I think churches would have less strife, would be less divided in our opinion, and we would see families, whole families come to Christ. 